But in terms of this event, if I can give an, a big introduction to that now, I'm delighted to say I'm joined today by Dr. Kristen Massey, who's joining us from Teesside University, and Professor Darren Lilliker, who's joining us from the University of Bournemouth. And we're going to be looking at university courses in politics. Kristen is going to open things up and introduce university courses in politics, including essentially what, what to expect, you know, an idea of what to expect on a politics programme. And then Darren is going to follow that up by talking about really what, why people do study politics at university. And the great thing about the event today is, is both colleagues are academic members of staff. So these are exactly the type of people, if you do go to university, that are actually going to be teaching you on the programme. So that should be really, really useful as well. I'm very conscious of these events. You're not tuning in to hear from me. You can tune in to hear from our fantastic speakers. So with that, I'll finish my introduction there and pass the floor, please, to our first speaker. That's Dr. Chris, Dr. Christopher Miss Massey, who is joining us from Teesside University. Over to you, Christopher. Um, thanks, John, and hello, everybody. Um, as John said, I'm Christopher Massey, and I'm one of the lecturers at Teesside University, and we have a BE politics degree. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about what it would look like if you did study a politics degree, what politics degrees around the country look like, and also just a bit more about you know, politics at university level, which might be a little different, I guess, from politics, say, at A level, for instance, if that's the journey that you're making. So without further ado, I'm going to pop uh, my screen up so that you can see uh, the slides that I've put together. OK, you should hopefully be able to see that now or certainly shortly. Um, so this is a 15 minute introduction in to what is politics like at university level. Um, as I've said, I'm Chris and I'll be taking you through this. So without further ado, the first slide that I have for you is this, and this is something that I often do when I'm looking at open days or outreach events, and I thought it would be a good thing to do today. Um, so what I'd ask you to do is have a think for maybe 30 seconds, I'll try and keep quiet for 30 seconds, about who these individuals on the slide are and what it might be that connects them together. So very briefly, because I know we only have a short amount of time, the reason that I put these slides up is because, and hopefully somebody has got that, whether you're watching this live or on the recording, that all these people have degrees with politics in their title. And this kind of goes to show why you would study politics at university and also the variety of careers that you can go into after doing a politics degree. So we've got Alec Baldwin, Miranda Hart, Rupert Murdoch and Barack Obama on the top row, and then George Alagaya. Jerry Springer and Harry Anfield on the bottom row. And you can see there, right from the President of the United States, a former president, through to you know, a media mogul in Rupert Murdoch, comedians, actors, news reporters, etc. Politics is a really wide and varied subject. And this is something that I've certainly experienced throughout my career. So I've been a lecturer now five years. But before that, because of my background in politics at university, I've also been a politician myself. I've worked for a member of the House of Lords. And I've also been a teacher. So it can really open doors into a variety of careers. So I just thought I'd have a very quick slide at the front to try and show that as a bit of an introduction. So we'll move on then to the very simple question, but a very difficult answer. What exactly is politics? Uh, and we'll look in a slide or two's time at what exactly that is at university level two. So what we've got here is, you know, politics, um, it's clearly, it exists because not everybody has the same interests or the same values. And also there's not enough resources oftentimes to go around and it's a system by which we decide how to distribute such resources. So no single definition of politics is, is accurate on its own. And this is something you would certainly learn at a university level. Um, but Harold Laswell's arguments all the way back in 1936, that politics is a way of deciding who gets what, when and how is a fairly good, simple introductory explanation that we would use on a university course. And in short, as it says on the bottom bullet point there, the university study of politics is often about finding out the who, what, when, and how of Laswell's argument there. And I think that's kind of a key introduction point that you would be thinking about if you were pursuing a politics degree uh, from this point on. So this is kind of one of the main content driven slides that I want to talk about today. And it's what does a politics history look like? As you'll be aware, you've probably sampled on different university websites and prospectuses, etc. The politics degrees, as it says, are very wide and very varied. Um, they will um, have very different modules depending on the academic studies that takes place, particularly amongst their members of staff. 
And so, for instance, my background is in um, political history, which is the first bullet point. So the politics degree that we have at Seaside University has a number of political history modules on it because that's the real strength of our uh, research and our departments. But other universities will have different strengths and obviously they will align some of their modules um, akin to those strengths. But what you would want to look for if you're looking for a politics degree is you know, find out which you know, angle of politics that you're particularly interested in. Also try and look maybe, you know, do you want to study another subject alongside politics? So things such as politics and international relations are very popular degrees because people want to do both strands. And realistically go through those prospectuses, go through um, the guides that are on university websites and try and match up your interests to a university course. Also look towards what the academics study and try and ensure that you've been, you know, you're being taught by experts in the field. I think that's a really key point as well. So I often say this to my students, you know, you know I, my background is on Labour Party history, uh, Labour Party politics. Um, you want me teaching you on the Labour Party module as opposed to maybe one of my colleagues because that's my you know, area of expertise. But whereas my colleague who's an IR expert, you want to teach the IR module. So I try to put three very quick, simple strands about politics together. So most degrees across the uh, UK university sector will have some modules that would look at current and past political events. And this can often be deemed a strand of politics called political history. You know, the study of you know, uh, political parties, the study of elections, the study of you know, change and different ideologies, etc. That would be one of the main strands. And as I said, that's my particular area of interest and in my particular research background. Uh, but there are also degrees and degree modules that study more about the models in politics and types of government and the political behaviour of governments and of electors. This can often be termed maybe political theory or political science, so it's a slightly different strand. This is something that removes politics away from history. There's a bit of a difference there. And also maybe a third broad strand that you would see as well is you'll often see the investigation of the work of theorists, um, and this would be political ideologies or ideas of the state. So, you know, all the way from things such as Hobbes and Marx, et cetera, we would study the broad theories that exist in politics and the people who have put those ideas out there to help us try and understand the world around us, because that's what politics really is. It's a degree um, and it's a discipline that tries to help us understand exactly what's going on now and what has taken place in the past. And the final bullet point there, as I mentioned a little earlier on, um, politics is wide and varied and it also, you know, associates itself very closely with a number of other disciplines. So you'll often see politics degrees that have joint honours attached to them. So I've mentioned politics and international relations, but there's also politics and history degrees, politics and philosophy, economics, etc. And if that's something that really interests you, some universities will have the option that you can pursue um, a joint honours degree with politics maybe as the main element or even as the minor element in that particular degree. So the last few slides I want to talk about today is about what is the academic study of politics. So a lot of people who you know, may be watching now or maybe uh, watching later on on the recording, what they're going to think about is that you've probably got an interest in politics to be here watching this video in the first place. But that interest in politics might be different to what the university study of politics looks like. So for instance, a lot of the students who may come on uh, the degrees that I teach on, they're interested in politics, they might be political party members, they might be people who are interested in you know the news reporting of politics etc but they may not have necessarily done an a level in politics they may not necessarily have that kind of grounding um, in academic study in the area they just have a real interest in it. so i tried to do in a very simple quick slide the two things that differentiate the university study of politics to um you know the hobby of politics or perhaps also even some a level courses in politics and those two things are the academic study at university, particularly as you go through the years at university, so this is absolutely something we would be looking for in the final year at university, what is level six or third year for most full-time students, you'd be looking towards trying to discover something entirely new. So you're trying to discover something that's not been written about before, um, whether that's a topic or a subsection of a topic, and or you also may want to provide a new and different interpretation or an event so this could either be building on existing scholarship or challenging existing scholarship and saying that you know what has taken place so far isn't completely accurate and maybe needs to be enough spoke added to the wheel. Um, and this is something that students build from their first years at university all the way through their last year. Um, and it's not something that people will necessarily be able to do on day one, but it's certainly something that people will be able to do as they leave because your dissertation effectively, which most university courses have a dissertation, like an individual project that might be around 10,000 words long, effectively tries to cover one of those two bases that I've just mentioned there. 
And I think this is what differentiates politics, as I've said, from maybe the college study or the hobby of politics to the university level study of politics, that you're trying to locate something different. You're not just repeating what other people have said, you're critiquing, analysing, evaluating what people have said to come up with something that's slightly different as the answer to a particular question. Uh, the last couple of slides I've got give you an example of that from my own background, which I thought might be illustrative for today. So you've got a photograph in front of you, but hopefully you can see all five members. Um, you may not be able to see the top right one because, uh, for instance, the video feed is on the top right one on my screen, but you can certainly see four. Um, have a think about these five people as I talk and think how many of them do you know? I've asked this question a lot, and I've asked this question at a variety of events with academics, um, with students, and with members of the public, and nobody ever has been able to name who all five of those individuals are. Most people will be able to name two, and some will be able to name maybe four, up to four, but no one ever gets all five. And there's a reason I'm telling this, which I will reveal in a minute or so's time. So hopefully you've had a chance to think about that while I've been speaking. And I'll tell you now that the two people that everybody gets there are Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. And if you can't see Gordon Brown, if the video feeds there, which is on my screen, Gordon Brown's hidden behind the video feed. Most people get those two individuals because they were both prime ministers um, and they're quite famous individuals. However, some people, and particularly some people who may have lived through this era of politics, will also get the other two individuals. So you've got on the far left there, Robin Cook, who was former foreign secretary in the UK, um, and then Second from the right, John Prescott, uh, who was the Deputy Prime Minister under Tony Blair. So most people get all four. No one ever gets number five. Number five is a chap called Lord Tom Sawyer. Um, and this effectively is, for me, this new interpretation and the new uh, piece of history, political history, that can be created, not just from this photograph, but by a study of that individual. So that's my example for you today of a project that could do something at university level, like I've just mentioned on the slide previously. So a very, very quick slide on who Tom Sawyer was. Tom Sawyer was the Deputy General Secretary, which basically means he was second in charge of the National Union of Public Employees, which became Unison, which is a trade union that exists today. Um, he also did a lot of work within the Labour Party. He was on the Labour Party's Executive Committee and moved the motion to establish um, an inquiry into Militant, which was a far-left group that got expelled from the Labour Party in the mid-80s, authored Labour's major policy changes, which Labour basically used to be quite left-wing in the 1980s and moved as the 80s gone on into the 90s into a more centre-left party. Tom was behind that. Uh, he was the General Secretary of the Labour Party, which is the absolute top official in the Labour Party. And he also kept an unpublished diary, which provides people a source space that they can investigate something that's never been looked at in that particular angle before. So the reason that I've given you this very quick example is to show that using Tom Sawyer's story, his diary, archive, this enabled my research in politics to have a new contribution. It's new research, it's never been done before. No one knows who this guy was, yet he was behind the scene active that I tried to bring out and tease out. And that's what university courses try and get you to be able to do. And I've seen students be able to do this. I've given you a personal example there, but I've seen a number of students over the years who have given me an entirely new interpretation on, you know, maybe it's an election, maybe it's a political party, maybe it's a political figure, Thatcher, Blair, Kinnock, whoever it may be, because of their skills that they learn at university through years one and yes, so they can do this by year three. And I thought I'd give you a personal example as opposed to pulling up one of my students' old work. So not only does this give new research, it's also a new interpretation because if you look in any book on the Labour Party, not many of them will mention Tom Sawyer at length. They might have one or two references towards him. Uh, but my argument is, and my book is on the screen there, that Tom Sawyer played a significant and uncredited role in Labour's general election in 1997. Uh, and that's kind of how you can use academic research to bring an argument out that can be very different. And that's what a politics course is about at university, trying to get you to a place where you can make a very you know, holistic argument with lots of evidence that could realistically change the course of written history. You know, you could try and change what people have read, read and written before into something very new. And I think that's kind of one of the key things about politics at university. So like I said, politics, it's a great course. It's something that I would recommend because it's a you know, part of my background as well. I would advise you, if you're interested in particular aspects of politics, look on university websites to see if that university teaches that you're interested in. So you know, if you really want to do something with, as I mentioned, international relations, for instance, make sure that you go to a university that has that. If you really want to do something about political history, go to a university that has that. And I think that could be a really top tip that I'd have for today. Um, and that's my 15 minutes up. So thank you very much for those who attended and those who are watching back. 
Um, if you have any inquiries, you can feel free to email me and I'll pass back over to John now. Thanks, John. Thank you, Chris. An excellent introduction to studying politics at university. And, and Chris, you're, you're, uh, I, got, I got four out of five, so you're, you're still at 100% in terms of the people that have done the, um, the test. But a great, great introduction, really appreciate that. And, and if you've got any questions for Chris, um, obviously the, this is for the people that are watching live, but if you've got any questions for Chris, please do drop them in the Q&A. Um, Chris has very kindly um, said he's going to be around for the next 15 minutes or so during the presentation that Darren's going to offer, um, if you've got any questions there. So thanks again, Chris. Brilliant. Our second speaker today is Professor Darren Lilliker, who is joining us from the University of Bournemouth. And Darren's going to um, run a session also, obviously, on politics, but looking at more so why study politics. And, and it might you know, it might be that Darren touches on a few of the similar things that Chris has, but there'll be you know, no doubt lots of, of new, really useful content in there as well. And certainly a different perspective on politics in addition to that, too. So, again, conscious that you're not tuning in to hear from me, let's pass the floor straight to Darren. Uh, Darren, over to you, please. So, hello, everyone. Um... Very pleased to be with you this afternoon and um, talk about why I study politics at university. Um, I've taught politics at university for um, ooh, nearly 25 years now. Um, started at Barnsley College, Sheffield University, and, and most recently down in Bournemouth. And it's one of those subjects that for many people um, is an alien concept. And I always find it fascinating to talk to people that are in the hairdresser or something, when they ask you what you're doing, and, and you tell them you're lecturing in politics. Um, and they, they give a variety of, of sort of responses to that. And it's usually a, oh, oh, politics, oh. Um, but also in society, and I think one of the uh, important things about studying university, uh, studying politics at university, is demystifying some of that, helping us to understand what politics is, how it works, and how we fit into the political system. And so my take on politics and, and the, the programs I'm involved in, and I, I teach on the politics, um, BA at Bournemouth, also BA at Politics and Economics, as well as our master's program, is that politics is one set of discipline, one discipline, if you like, one set of ideas. But also, we draw on sociology, we draw on um, psychology, and bring us a rounded picture of, of society, how it works, how people work, and so how politics fits into all of those things. So firstly, it, it's there's quite a bit of research on how people respond to politics. And often we find that politics is, is very much perceived as, as a black box. It happens within a bubble. People often talk about the Westminster bubble, for example. Something is done in this place to citizens. And it doesn't really matter if it's Westminster, if it's Washington, if it's Brussels, if it's the United Nations. These are places where politics happens. And politics is seen as a, as a series of practices that have traditions and ways of doing things that isn't as familiar to people. It's almost alien to people. And so the process of, pol of teaching politics and, and studying politics is to demystify that, to unpack this black box, to open it up and see what's inside and how it works and to understand it. So we've, we've seen one definition of politics. Um, I prefer one that, that's focused on looking at how power is achieved and how power is used. because it opens it up not just to think about how politicians operate, but also how people operate. And understanding that we are all political to some extent, and we all have some degree of power and influence. Even if it's just our vote, we have some power and influence. And so how people think about using it is as important part of politics as how the power of government is used in many ways. So my approach to politics is thinking about these three interconnected spheres. We think about political actors, and, and often we see them being in these bubbles, as I've said, in Westminster, in, in Washington, wherever they reside and, and operate. But really, they're just part of us. They're part of the broader citizenry. And they may seem to work on different ways and think in different ways, but fundamentally, they're part of us. They represent us. 
and any of us can be one of them. And part of thinking about going into politics and studying politics is thinking about the sort of career one might want. Um, does somebody want to be elected? Do you want to be working for a pressure group or a charity? All of these work in politics to some degree or another. Politics is not just something that happens in Westminster. It happens all the way down to very, very local level and is also dispersed across a whole range of institutions which are national and international. And we all take part in those to some degree. We're also part of the media. We influence the media by our audience habits, but we also can broadcast, we can share our views, we can perform a media role, even if it's just updating our status on Facebook. We are saying something to somebody else that could be political, if one chooses to. So thinking about how these spheres interconnect, how citizens and politicians and people who work in politics overlap, how they interact with one another, how both interact with the media is an important part of thinking about how the system really works. It's not just about locked, sealed institutions, it's about interactions between institutions and how they then make power work, make governing work, make society work. So think about some of the things that, that unpack these. Firstly, we have to think about winning power. And elections are one um, way in which power is won. Um, and elections, there are lots of arguments, ideological arguments, differences of opinion on how particular area of policy, the National Health Service, for example, should be run. There are lots of those arguments taking place. And often these boil down to very, very simple messages and slogans, get Brexit done, for the many, not the few, Make America great again. These, these slogans that circulate that have meaning to people. An important part of a lot of these is the psychology. What does it mean when people see a message? What does that message mean to them? How do they interpret it? The same with images and events. How do people interpret these images? And that can be the, the overall image of a politician coming for election, or it can be the simple image that we see of that politician how they look at a certain time, how they perform during a debate, the overall way in which they look. What event? Who are they seen with? Are people seen smiling at them? There's a whole range of different ways in which people are influenced. And all of those can shape the extent to which somebody wins or loses an election. But outside of election time, all of these things are also happening. At present, Boris Johnson needs to be trusted. And so the arguments he's making, the messages he is laying out to the country, the slogans being used, stay alert, etc. The images of him appearing on camera, the events he's going to, all of those are part of him managing who he is and how we see him, and his maintenance of power over the story, over the narrative, um, particularly at the moment around COVID-19. But a whole range of other actors are also taking part in that. NGOs, the opposition, charities, a variety of campaign groups, they're all making their own arguments. They've all got their own messages, their own slogans, and they try to get access to the media in their own way. And that may be their presence on social media, it may be trying to get front page news on, on the tabloid, it may be appearance on the BBC News, Channel 4 News, etc. So everyone is in some way involved in this business of winning power to some degree. It may not be political power in terms of governing, but it will be power over how people think, what people are thinking about. And so understanding those processes is a really, really important way of understanding how politics is working within a country, what's happening at a particular time and what. And of course, thinking about all of that is thinking about society. Um, we live in a quite polarized society, people say. Um, polarized over different views, polarized over Brexit, polarized over Donald Trump. All these different societies have these varieties of different schisms in them, divisions between different groups of people. 
some also argue that the greatest form of polarization is between between those who feel that they have power and those who feel excluded from power that have and have not and so how people feel is very very important in society do they feel democracy is working well for them do they feel that there is someone who represents them do they, do they feel that someone is speaking on their behalf to those in power a very important question that we look at in politics because they affect the three, no one on that side, but the, the concepts are really, really important in politics. Do we trust those people who are in power? Now, it doesn't have to be the prime minister, it can be a whole range of different people who we believe are represented in some way. But trusting them is fundamental. Because trusting them means we listen to them and we engage with what they're saying. We listen, we process, we think about what they're saying. We decide whether we're going to comply with the instructions they give. It also impacts upon participation. And while there's often around a third of people never vote, and it may not be the same people, but around a third don't vote in, in elections, the reasons they give are not always that they can't be bothered and they don't understand things. But when we drill down to that, we find lots of very, very complex reasons why people don't participate. Because no one represents them, because anybody could be trusted. Um, and it may start off being a very, very simple explanation, but it can become very, very complex when you encourage people to really talk about the feelings of politics. And those are things that, that it draws on sociology, it draws on psychology, but helps us to understand politics. And that's a fundamental part of of studying public university is to really drilling down into some of these these concepts, some of these in a in a way well rehearsed phrases. That I don't trust politicians, and what does that really mean? Why don't we trust politicians? What can we do about it? And we also um, study the power of voice, and and communication is is becoming a, a really important part of the study of politics. You, you look at some, uh, many programs around the country, some still do not have as, as strong a focus on, on communication as others. But communication is really, really fundamental because that is the foundation of the relationship between citizens, media, and politics. It's the bit where they all overlap is what is being said. So we need the role of media. We need media that will perform a task of objective reporting of telling us what's happening in a way that's not biased to one side or another, but is telling us that what is happening, what's working well, what may not be working as well. There's also a problem often with media in terms of uh, over sensationalization. We focus on the scandals and splits and whether a particular prime minister is falling out with you know, somebody else in cabinet with the long stories, um, which I'm sure Chris is well aware of, of the, the schism between Gordon Brown and Tony Blair um, during Tony Blair's time as Prime Minister. And all of these things are, are stories the media use, but what we really need is, is some kind of objective reporting of, of looking at them. And so think about how the media work is important. Also about the amplification. Do they amplify the arguments from one side or another? Do they just repeat what the government's saying? Do they just repeat what the opposition is saying? Is their commentary loaded with their own bias? But also important in the power of voice is us the people. What mechanism, mechanisms can we use to challenge power? Is it just something that we can tell politicians and don't trust them on Facebook? Or what else can we do? What are the mechanisms that charities offer? What do NGOs offer? What do campaign groups offer? What does it look like 38 degrees on momentum offer, where people can come together and challenge power within a party, within the nation? And to what extent can we have proper open debates with those we elect? So thinking about how we can have that conversation between those in power um, and us as citizens. So important part of understanding those dynamics and relationships um, within um, politics. Is important. And we are all thinking, I'm sure at the moment, about what is happening 
COVID-19's impact, but what it really illuminates is the different ways in which politics happens and how politics does impact. We have very, very local politics. One of our local councillors here in Bournemouth they kind of set the emergency because there was too many tourists. Leicester, though, was locked down by the government. So there's different ways in which politics takes place in towns and cities. And of course, within the United Kingdom, we have really four nations running at different speeds in terms of what's happening. They have different approaches to dealing with the pandemic. We also have the Westminster level of politics where politics is occurring within a nation, but we also have politics across nations, across the U European Union, across the world, the relationship with the World Health Organization, proves just how politics is global. And COVID-19 will be something that I'm sure will be not necessarily on the curriculum um, in September, but a thread running through many programs because it illuminates all these different levels of politics and the way in which governments have responded, NGOs have responded, civil society, the organization has responded. So it's an excellent case study, understanding it, understanding how these different things work, is illuminated by our understanding of politics and who has power and how power is shaped in these different contexts. So, final points about studying politics. And this can help us think about the, the sorts of careers we're looking at, the sorts of goals we have in life, the sorts of things we want to be involved in, even if we don't want to establish, um, be a politician or be active in politics, things that can help us get somewhere else in, in, in a particular career. Um, so understanding how, who has power, how they gain it, um, is important in many, many contexts. Politics takes place everywhere. So understanding those different relationships is very, very important. How power is exercised and diffused, how power is given away, um, not just to devolve government, but also sort of down organizations and within society is, is an important part of understanding the politics of the system. It also helps us understand the inequalities and also protest movements. Black Lives Matter, for example, has, has sort of really shone a light on how people feel about power and the inequalities and how power has not been fully sort of used across a group of citizens. It helps also understand how to influence people in power or how to gain power or gain more influence. And think about the mechanisms we use in national politics and global politics. And that helps us also understand how we ourselves can leverage some influence at a local level within our organization. And so understanding influence, change, control, and the narrative, what's being said, how things are being framed. These are important parts of studying politics and something that's been embedded in most universe degrees um, and a fundamental part of, of thinking about how politics works and university uh, programs focus on these sorts of elements and so open up a wide range of careers moving forward. Thank you.